this is Julia with episode number 68 of the Mixology Talk podcast. It is not quite spring, but we're going to live in denial anyway, and we're going to start talking about yummy things growing in the ground. And by that, I mean vegetables. We're skipping fruit all together this week and talking a little bit more about how you can use vegetables in your cocktails. So stay tuned. So it seems like fruit gets all the play in cocktails. Lemons, limes, they're just pretty ubiquitous. And then you've got other tasty things like apples and pears. And well, this time of year in the deep winter, lots of apples and pears. But when you start to get into springtime, it's fun to think outside the fruit tree and think a little bit more about what you can do with vegetables. So that's what we're going to be talking about this week. Yeah. And working with vegetables and cocktails can be pretty difficult. It could also be pretty easy as well, depending on, you know, how uh, how you put them in a, into the drink. But um, it can definitely present some of the challenges, too. Right. I think, I mean, the first and foremost thing is that typically when you're looking at fruit, um, they bring some sweetness, um, which is a pretty easy thing to work into a cocktail. But vegetables, not so much. You may get the flavor, but you often don't get that sort of corresponding su- sweetness that you can expect with fruit. Right. And a lot of the vegetables have their own natural sweetness, but you have to take some special techniques in order to draw out some of that sugar naturally. That's a good point. That's a really so, good point. Um, like carrot juice, for instance, um, has a lot of sugar in it. A lot of people don't think about that, but it actually has a good amount of sugar. So, you know, you just kind of try to figure out how you want to be able to extract that sugar and use it into cocktails. So speaking of carrot juice, the first way that you can go ahead and put vegetables into your cocktail is by using vegetable juice. Yeah. And uh, we've done this a couple different times in a couple different ways in the past with (laughs) differing uh, degrees of success and failure. I will go ahead and admit (laughs) that right now. That's true. So in order to use juice in this way, it's really important to have a really good juice machine. Yeah, you can't really uh, throw a carrot into your lime squeezer, can you? (laughs) Not really. So (laughs) it takes a lot more preparation, but it also has a lot of natural vitamins and flavor to it that you just don't get from squeezing a carrot through a lime press. (laughs) That just sounds like it, somebody would get their eye taken out. Yeah, probably. So basically, you're looking at a, at a, a mechanical juicer of some sort. And no, is there a typical uh, kind of juicer that you prefer for this application? Or actually, there are a couple that I've used in the past. I will say, spend the money and get a really good juice machine, machine because um, you're going to put this thing through a lot of stress. Yeah, and you're pulling a lot of fibers out of some of these products that we're working with. And uh, it can gum up the the motor. And so spend good money on a juice machine if it's for industrial use. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And it it will... It'll pay for itself, yeah. It will definitely pay for itself, yeah. And by the way, if you're you're looking for something for personal use, um, or I suppose even behind the bar, um, go ahead and take a look at... At websites like uh, Craigslist, um, there are a lot of these sorts of things, some of them even brand new in box, especially right after Christmas time, um, that you can buy for way, way cheaper than retail. So you can get a good quality machine without spending the, quite as much money. Yeah. Um, so the first juice that kind of comes to mind, we've already kind of talked about carrot juice. So I guess the second juice <laughs> that comes to mind, uh, especially for the spring, is tomato juice. Which is a little bit of a cheat. <laughs> kind of technically lying on this one. I'm not going to lie. it's technically a fruit. Yeah. Well, but- I guess I am technically going to lie. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're lying. You're totally lying. But um, I think it's a little bit fair to put it in this category. As a culture, we don't really treat tomato juice like a fruit. We treat it more like a vegetable. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to. I'm going to allow it. Yeah. And if we think about V8, I mean, it's not just tomato juice. It's got seven other ingredients in there, right? <laughs> this is I not a sponsored salt podcast. <laughs> so, salt is seven of them, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so tomato juice is definitely a, another good option. There's a couple other less common options that you definitely could use. I mean, the first couple that come to mind for me are celery juice and cucumber. I know I know it's it's more like cucumber water really when you mm-hmm. juice it, right? But it's right. still got a very subtle flavor and you do see cucumbers quite a bit in cocktails. Yeah, absolutely. What about beet juice? I know it's again not quite a vegetable, but I've definitely seen folks using like like roasting beets and then juicing that um to make a very a very very brightly colored juice for their cocktails. Yeah, and this is where a really good juice machine is going to come in handy. I've Worked with beets in the past, and they can be very challenging. 
Um, Probably wear clothes that you don't care about, I would right, imagine. And gloves, because that stuff, it takes days to get out of your skin. So yeah, just have a plan on how you're going to do it. I think uh, how I used it was, like you mentioned, roasting them, pureeing them, and then squeezing all of the water out of them. Probably through cheesecloth or, or a chinois or something like that. Right. And so um, what you're left with is a, just a really clean juice. Um, if you try to throw a beet, a whole beet in a juice machine, it, it's like throwing a rock in a blender. I mean, it's just, it really, you have it's gonna to It's going to make some really horrible noises, there. isn't it? Right. So a good juice, a uh, high quality juice machine uh, would be able to do it, but you're definitely going to stress the machine out for sure. Yeah, I would probably chop it up, roast it first, um, and then toss it in the juicer if you actually want to use your juicer again. Yeah, so we mentioned techniques uh, in the very beginning. This roasting is a really great technique on drawing out sugars from vegetables. It'll caramelize the sugars that are already present, reduce some of the water content, so really start to concentrate those flavors. So roasting vegetables are a great way to use them in cocktails. Yeah, actually, now that I think about it, if you roast carrots, they taste much, much sweeter. Right. And they're much softer as well, which again, expedites the juicing process. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So moving on from juice, and now we're going to talk a little bit about purees, which I guess in some ways aren't that different from juice. Not really. It's, it's a different technique. A, it's a juice without all the bits removed, right? Right. Very similar. Um, roasting definitely helps speed this process along. Um, the difference with puree is you're adding um, some extra sugar in there, typically mm -hmm. some acid of some form, um, just to balance out the flavors a little bit. So it's a little bit more of a constructive process. You have to build it up a little bit more. Um, but for the most part, you're pretty much just going through a lot of the similar steps. And to make a puree, you're definitely not using a juicer, right? You can. You usually use a blender or food processor, right, if I remember exactly. correctly. Mm -hmm. So what you'll do is, um, well, let's let's talk about an example. You made a cocktail probably about a year ago that used a red pepper, a red bell pepper puree, and it was amazing. So how did you go about making that puree? Just like we mentioned before, I roasted the bell pepper. I took the skins off. And if you ever had roasted bell peppers out of the oven, they're, they're really kind of watery. Um, they kind of steam in their own bag. You know, mm -hmm. that's one way of preparing... Uh, roasted bell peppers and you just kind of rip the skins off of them but they're really really sweet yeah so i thought hey it'd be kind of fun to work this into a cocktail so that's kind of what i did I, I roasted them steamed them took the skins off and put it in a blender and add a little bit of water some lime juice and a little bit of sugar uh, just yeah. to kind of you know round everything out and some salt and pepper and that was it did you have to strain it out to pull out any fibers or? Yeah. So you definitely want to start to strain the stuff out and just get it as kind of a clean running liquid as possible. So yeah. definitely want to do a chinois kind of coated in cheesecloth um, and just let it sit over time, add a little bit of weight to it, but you don't want to force all that material through the cheesecloth. You yeah, kind of want it naturally. If, if you do that, you're going to end up with a, a cocktail that, that has those fibers in it. And actually a perfect example of that um, was a, I guess we, we did a, an article, if I remember correctly, on pumpkin puree. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't remember if there was a video as well now that I think back on it, but um, we were experimenting with different ways of actually getting the pumpkin flavor in cocktails. And the real challenge there was was those fibers that came with. And again, pumpkin's not quite a vegetable, but in some ways it can be a little similar. And um, what you find is those little tiny fibers will leave a rim on the inside of your glass when you serve the cocktail, which is really not ideal um, from a visual perspective. Right. And some of that residue could also be attributed to items with heavy starch content. So pumpkin has some natural starches in them. Would beets have that problem? Beets would have that problem. Uh, sweet potatoes. If you're working sweet potatoes in a cocktail, you're going to run into the same problem. Um, so by roasting it, it kind of starts to cut down a lot on those starches and converts them into sugars. Got so it. That's another reason that um, roasting is a really good technique for for implementing in, or to adding uh, layers of flavor in a cocktail. That makes sense. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. So another way that I think is getting a little bit more common than the ways we talked about earlier is muddling vegetables. Um, this is something you, I, I think, probably the most common version you'll see here is cucumber, right? Cucumber, peppers. I know peppers are a pretty big one too. Bell peppers? Uh, not really bell peppers. Usually like serrano peppers, jalapenos. Oh, that's true. Yeah, you'll, so, you'll often see those with uh, with tequila. Right, like margaritas, spicy margaritas, exactly what it is. Actually, it's usually a tropical fruit paired with some form of chili. Yeah, you're right now that you mentioned it. <laughs> right. So it's usually like mango and jalapeno or serrano and pineapple. Sounds really good. I know. It's Yeah, exactly. But we're not talking about fruit with the <laughs> exception of tomato. Right. But uh, muddling is a really easy technique. 
Um, I remember when I first started getting into crafting cocktails, um, that was kind of my default move. Let's throw it in a glass, muddle it, and pour a bunch of booze in it and see what happens. How'd that work with beets? Messy. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of broken glass, but it's a really great way of extracting flavor, especially really fresh, vibrant flavor like cucumbers and jalapenos where you don't really want to cook them. You want to preserve all that natural water and all that natural flavor. This is an absolutely fantastic technique to incorporate some some of those fresh ingredients. What about something like celery where you've got a, it, it's a very fresh, vibrant flavor, but it's got all sorts of little sinews in, in there. Yeah, muddling would be a great technique for this. As um, long as you go ahead and strain it at the end. Yeah, or not. I remember I did a cocktail with pineapple and celery. The key with that one is I actually left it diced in the in the glass, um, but you want to remove all the fibers, the ribs. Oh, that makes sense. Right. So just remove as many of those ribs as possible because you don't want that kind of stuff getting stuck in your teeth. Right. But then, yeah, I just left it kind of, I, I don't remember if I pickled the celery or not. But anyways, I left it in the cocktail, kind of like Pop Rocks or, you know, <laughs> <laughs> not Nature's Pop Rocks, Pop Rocks. but uh, something kind of textural to have in the drink. That so. makes sense. Yeah. Well, speaking of texture, I think another another one that you have made in the past, probably my one of my favorite cocktails that you've ever made was something you made for a restaurant you were working with. Um, we always called this one the salad cocktail. Yeah. I don't remember what it was actually called, but I remember it was just gorgeous because there was all kinds of different things in the glass, just all sorts of things. And one of those things was these beautiful, gorgeous radishes. Yeah, we that cocktail was um, very difficult to create i'm not gonna lie it, it was a salad it I was mean, we, and even internally in the restaurant we call it the salad cocktail oh it wasn't just me no the name the name was something different on the menu but it was a really big challenge um to get it right so we used salt pepper radishes arugula uh, i think the base of it was uh citron vodka if i'm not not, not mistaken i'm surprised it wasn't gin yeah, I think we tried gin. It was just too, too planty. Er yeah, too <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. Can see so, that. you know, I mean, this one took, on this menu design, it took the longest to get right because uh, so this is something good, good to bring up for everyone too, especially with muddling, is um, you get inconsistent product. Absolutely. So how do you scale that? Like one pepper is going to be different from another, but unless you're tasting every single cocktail that goes out the door and adjusting the recipe slightly... How are you going to get, get that consistency? So that unless was, you go ahead and try to, you know, do something like juicing or or making a puree where you can make a big old batch. Right, exactly. So that's one of the biggest drawbacks for muddling is just inconsistent quality of product. And it's just it's almost impossible to to do this. So it takes a little bit more of a kind of an assertive effort to to make it right every single time. But yeah, it was a great cocktail. I think we actually garnished that with a uh, lemon infused olive oil. Oh, wow. So I'm, like I'm saying, this was a very, very ambitious kind of cutting edge cocktail. We'll say that. Um, it was delicious, though. Yeah. It and fantastic. visually, it was beautiful. It was really, really great. And um, the hardest thing to do was actually to tie this cocktail together because it was so herbal and it, there was not any sweetener in there and it was perfectly clear for one thing mm -hmm. so the only color in it was the muddled vegetables we didn't add any sweetener and then uh we were messing around with it and seven up no was the sweetening like just half an ounce of seven up is what brought everything together are you serious this yeah. whole time i had no idea there was seven up just in that cocktail. the smallest amount like you couldn't even get like effervescence from it it was so small but just that little bit tied the whole cocktail together and brought everything together it that was, it was crazy. crazy yeah that's hilarious I yeah love I, don't, it. I don't even think we use citrus i think that was just like vodka it was a very unusual cocktail it was mm -hmm. a very different flavor profile from anything i'd had before it was not overly sweet yeah uh, i mean but it it worked it absolutely worked do you have the, do you still have the recipe i think i do I'll have to look if at that. If we find it. <laughs> if we can find it. I mean, this is this is going back years. Years. Yeah. If we can find it, and if we can find a photo as well, we'll throw those in the show notes over at mixologytalk.com slash 68. Right. I hope we can find them. I know, me I too. I know, it was such a beautiful cocktail. So the next way that you can go ahead and put vegetables in your drink is perhaps a little bit less common. However, very, very tasty. And that is using shrubs. Yeah, so this is a very old technique of preserving flavors basically in vinegar now when i think of i mean 
I, I would almost put pickling in a similar category here. It's not the same thing, but in some ways it's sort of a similar uh, idea close. of preserving right. flavor. Yeah. Um, often with shrubs, you'll, you'll see a lot of fruits being used, but mm-hmm. I don't think you need to limit it to that. Yeah, you can definitely, you can pretty much throw anything in a shrub as long as the flavor components work together, right? So you're not going to put watermelon and... I don't know, something that doesn't go with watermelon together. Uh, Green peas. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, it may mind. work. I don't know. But yeah, you really want to be conscious of the flavor profiles that you're trying to create. Um, and when we're talking about vinegar, we're not talking about high strength white cleaning vinegar. We're talking about more subtle vinegars like rice wine vinegar or um, I think we're, we've are we been using palm vinegar. Yep. So really subtle vinegars that aren't super sharp. Well, and you'll, you'll, I've noticed that you'll sometimes dilute them too. Um, a- to taste. Right, exactly. So you add some water, let it balance out a little bit. Um, and creating a good shrub can take some time. So this is where production comes into play. Mm-hmm. And, you know, really putting the effort in beforehand um, to extract those flavors so you can use them much faster in a cocktail. And once again, um, once when you use vegetables in that way, you can start to account for the for the product variability as well. Right. And so one of the biggest words of caution about using shrubs in a cocktail menu is the number of stupid jokes you're going to get based off of Monty Python. Do you remember this? That's hilarious. Right. Now that you mention it, I totally remember, but do you really get a lot of jokes? You'll get it all the time. You you could almost do like a running bet on a shift. That's like like an occupational hazard. Right. Exactly. (laughs) It's almost kind of like, you know, I don't even want to go down this road. I expected but, you to say something like people being weirded out by drinking vinegar. It's it's actually pretty common in um, craft cocktails now is to use so shrubs. So people expect it. So they do. But then you'll get probably one or two a night. Shrubbery. Right. Except bring me your shrubs or, you know, just go <laughs> down this whole thing. And if you're a Monty Python fan, like most of us are, it's it's great. After a the couple of months, it gets times. pretty tiring. <laughs> So uh, note note to your cocktail menu creator, this is definitely an occupational hazard you might run into. <laughs> and you can make a game out of it, like do an over-under for the shift. Like, like all right, it. guys, what do you think? How many how many idiots are going to say a stupid shrub joke? I don't know. Tom, I got I got four. <laughs> all right, over-under, and everybody could take bets. So you like turn it. it into a game. But yeah, you could uh, pretty much make anything into a shrub. I remember uh, there was a gentleman down in... Um, New Orleans that works at Hi Hat that we ran into. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. He was making mayatake mushroom shrubs, and it was fantastic. It so, was really crazy. Yeah, yeah, so you can make shrubs pretty much out of anything. Not quite a vegetable. Not quite a vegetable. We're not doing a good job of staying uh, on we're topic. We're so far off. I know. <laughs> That's okay. It's our own podcast. I guess we can kind of do whatever we want. <laughs> pretty much. Sorry, guys. Yeah. <laughs> So the very last way, and this is probably the most common of all, the way that you can put uh, vegetables in your cocktail is no longer drinking them at all, but using them as garnish. Yeah, and this is really easy. And um, Just stuff it in a yeah, glass. Pretty much just throw it in a glass. I mean, if you look at some of the concoctions that are coming out with um, around Bloody Marys. Yeah, that was my first thought. <laughs> they're, just, they're, they're kind of silly. They're over the top. Some of them have like a drumstick from a fried chicken not also not a vegetable, a vegetable. <laughs> you know? but you know with pickling and all these things you know it reinforces some of the flavors that are already in there um so pickling garnishes is another common way that you could put them in cocktails so yeah you can add garnishes on pretty much anything i remember uh, one cocktail we made was a strawberry base with uh, a fennel syrup and then we use the fennel fronds to kind of reinforce both the visual and the taste um and it looks really beautiful on top of the cocktail yeah it's a really great looking garnish some other ideas if you're using carrots you could also use the carrot greens the tops of the carrots for a garnish also so you know just think of different ways you can use kind of the whole plant i guess um, and have some fun with it. Yeah, I've also seen uh, green beans. Again, a lot of these are kind of the, the Bloody Mary yeah. style of drink. But I, I mean, not, you're definitely not limited to that. Certainly cucumber. That's very, very common. Yep. Um, and again, uh, radish. I think the, the nice thing about radish is they've got a, a really, a really nice crunch. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of them are just gorgeous. Yeah, they have some really beautiful radishes out there. Um, the beets as well. They got uh, candy yeah. cane beets. So visually, they just stand out. And you can slice them very, very thin and slide them just down the side of your glass Mm -hmm. and so you'll get a really beautiful profile 
So yeah, you can actually uh, do some roasting with those too to bring out some of the flavor or like a brulee some of the the, the radishes and really add some contrast and some visual elements to it as well. So there is a ton of fun things you can do uh, for the garnish with vegetables. Yeah, definitely. So before we forget, <laughs> let's go back and talk a little bit about syrups. We forgot about this one in our notes, but I don't think we can skip it now. No, no, absolutely It's such yeah. a great idea. So it sounds like you made a syrup out of fennel. Right, right. So um, this one can be a little bit more difficult um, because in order to extract as much flavor as you need, um, you have to be a little bit um, careful. But so, yeah, it could be a little bit difficult to work with vegetables and syrups. But I know that David Arnold has a really good technique that he uses to kind of preserve some of the color and some of the flavor uh, of the vegetable um, is that syrups. The, is that the problem that you're seeing is when you cook it, you start to lose that freshness? Yeah, you lose some of the freshness. Um, and if you just put it in a blender, um, it begins to oxidize. So oh. a really vibrant green will start to turn brown pretty quickly. Of course. Um, it's something you'll see if you use... Uh, celery juice in mm-hmm. some cocktails unless you preserve it and prevent the oxidation um, it can turn within five minutes yeah um, it'll still taste great but visually it's not so kind of a little bit more murky it's not a very brilliant color um, but yeah if you haven't checked out david arnold's book i highly recommend it um, yeah we'll put a link to that in yeah, the show notes for sure if there was only like three books you can have on your bookshelf for cocktails that would probably be one of the probably the number one or number two book for me. Definitely. That's, that's a great book. I think, I think we actually bought it the day that it hit the market, which is not surprising at all. Right. Yeah. Nobody will be surprised to hear that. (laughs) Well, I can't think of anything else we forgot in this episode. Yeah. And at the, at, at the very least, have fun with it. Yeah, exactly. And that's, and that's really the, the, the long and short of it, you know, experiment, have a good time. The nice thing about vegetables is if they're in season, they're inexpensive, you know, just walk around your grocery store, take a look at what's, what's around and, and, and play with it. Yeah. Yeah. Taste them and see, and start to think about what ingredients would be compatible, you know, with that flavor profile. And if you've put together some interesting cocktails using vegetables, we'd love to hear about it. Go ahead and leave us a comment at mixologytalk.com slash 68. I would love to hear about your cocktails. Well, cheers, everyone. And we will catch you in a couple weeks. Absolutely. Never miss an episode by subscribing in iTunes or YouTube. And as always, check out the show notes by clicking on the right.